Good day. Welcome to the Earnings Review, your tidbits into company financials and operational insights. On the show, we engage top Echelon executives to get you up to speed with first-hand information. We also chat with the most competent analysts on the market just to ensure you are finished with relevant and comprehensive market analysis. Today, we focus on Dairy Board, Zimbabwe's largest dairy producer. Dairy Board recently released its 2019 financials and we are going to have a look at those very figures in depth. Now, just to take you into a sneak peek of the timeline of Dairy Board, well, of course, the entity produces dairy products as well as food products with four property units under its belt. Um, established in 1951 as a dairy marketing board, it was incorporated as a Dairy Board Zimbabwe in 1994. A key development took place in 1997 when the entity was disbanded from being a state-owned enterprise into a private institution, which was then at that point listed on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. 2006, the entity is transformed into a holding company company with four subsidiaries, mainly Dairy Board Zimbabwe Private Limited, Lions Dairy Board Malawi, as well as NFB Logistics Private Limited. 2016, the entity underwent a restructuring exercise and of course the entity runs as Dairy Board Holdings. Now, in just a moment, we will be crossing over to an online conversation with the executives as well as our in-house analysts to look into the nitty gritties of how Dairy Board has performed over the past year. Stay with us. Now joining us from Dairy Board Zimbabwe is the Chief Executive, Mr. Anthony Mandiwanza. Anthony, good day and thank you for joining us. To get started, how are you faring under the COVID-19 conditions? Well, I mean, we, we, we are feeling the negative impact of, uh, of, uh, of COVID um, from a multidimensional perspectives. Uh, first, the local, the disruption on the value chains, on the supply side, uh, on our route to market, those disruptions are quite significant. We felt the, uh, the major impact of it in April. Uh, and of course, we are still in it up to now. So that will distort, uh, obviously, the out outlook for 2020. We also feel the international or the global, global impact disruptions uh, on the key raw and packaging material, mainly because the lead times are, are longer than originally had been planned. So those are the kind of issues which we are, we are experiencing as a result of this pandemic. On the consumption side, the economy is largely foreign, uh, sorry, um, informal market. And therefore, the lockdown simply shut down a close to 70% of the economy. And, and obviously, that is a negative impact on our, on, our, on our demand for our goods and services. So the, there are quite a wide range of a negative impact triggered by, by COVID-19. Um, fair enough. Um, I know we would need to come back to this a little bit later, but let's get into yep. um, your most recent uh, financials for 2019. Um, your profit after tax surging 328% to 142 million Zimbabwean dollars in inflation adjusted terms. Uh, and of course your revenue growing there 60% to 1.1 billion Zimbabwean dollars, um, and, and, and in, in of course inflation adjusted terms, your operating profit also increasing by 64% um, to 90 million Zimbabwean dollars. Just in a nutshell, would you want to take us through some of the details that influenced this very particular performance? Okay, well, I, I, I think I think what you probably see. Uh, the key features of our financial performance in 2019 relates to our volumes. Um, 
by and large, we managed to achieve a volume performance which was better than many companies in the uh, fast food uh, businesses. Um, therefore, the decline of 17% ought to be looked in the context of uh, um, between 25 and 30% in the FMCG, uh, clearly driven by, by our, our strong brands. We sustained our market share by and large in 2019, um, so that it contributed to uh, the top line uh, in terms of volumes and the pricing. We were able to at least uh, adjust our prices uh, in line uh, with inflation during the year. Um, and, and that gave us that top line performance uh, which in historical terms, uh, 497 uh, million and inflation adjusted 1.1 billion dollars. And then we moved and looked at the, uh, at the, in fact, whilst I'm still on the volumes, the major uh, driver was milk intake, where we experienced a positive growth of 10% uh, milk growth during the period. Uh, compared to industry growth of seven percent, um, and and clearly, it uh, you know it, it reflects uh, the investment we've been making into the milk supply supply development unit to support our farmers with the extension services, to support our farmers with the veterinary services, uh, and general uh, general animal husband uh, has received. A significant attention during the um, Anthony in terms of your milk sales in 2019 um, you had sales of 72.9 million liters juxtapose that to how you have performed over the past five years you have averaged 83 million liters which is a significant slump in terms of the volumes there would you want to shed more light where that particular development is concerned that precisely you need to look at it in the context of the overall economic uh, situation in the country. Um, if you look at the manufacturing sector, particularly FMCG sector, the likes of Delta Corporation, National Food, um, et cetera, et cetera, you will find the following features uh, were quite uh, pronounced in 2019. One, capacity utilization refer to CZI, a manufacturing sector survey, and it clearly shows that the capacity utilization dropped from, from about 40, 47 to about 45 to 34% during the year in 2019. Um, and, and, and the trend actually was commonplace in most of the companies uh, uh, which are in the FMCG. Our own capacity utilization, we, we have remained in the region of about 50% capacity utilization. Therefore, the volume drop of 17% uh, must be looked in that context. We believe it was, uh, we, in fact, we performed better than, than the general FMCG sector. And that's why I was saying uh, it speaks to a number of initiatives on the supply side it was driven more by milk supply growth of 10% positive growth in 2019 compared to 2018 milk production growth um, driven by the initiatives which, which I have re uh, referred to. Um, um, Anthony, while we're still on revenue, can you give us a breakdown in terms of contribution? In 2017, your beverages contributed 41% to revenue. In 2018, that figure went up to 44%. What is the breakdown in as far as the 2019 financials are concerned? The, as you know, that our portfolio uh, is, is anchored on three, uh, three basic pillars which is the liquid milks, uh, and then you have the foods and the beverages. The performance for 2019 for liquid milks was approximately 40% uh, 
of the total contribution, the foods were 9% and the beverages 52%. Those are the three key pillars of our, of, of our business. And, and the, uh, the, the area where there was a significant drop is around the food, uh, which dropped from, from, from 20, 2018 to, to, to about 20, 2019. They dropped from 12%, the foods dropped from 12% to 9%. That, that is where we experience uh, that drop. The, the beverages remain almost uh, in the same in the range of 52 and 51%. Um, and, a, a, and, a, and, a slight, and a slight growth on your meals from about 37% to 40%. Um, there is a difference in the results between the inflation adjusted and the historical to cite the profit after tax and inflation adjusted terms came in at 141 million dollars in historical terms that figure is 50 million for 2019 2018 inflation adjusted is um, at uh, 31 million while in historical terms is it's 5 million well for the sake of our viewers I'll throw this one to respect our equity access analyst what what is the implication of this very particular development? Would you want to shed more light um, in that regard? For me to respond to that, uh, inflation adjusted earnings simply factor the impact of inflation on, um, on, on, on earnings or on, uh, on, 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 on revenue. So this basically means that if you earn certain money in terms of yourselves, you then have to factor in the inflation factor and normally or typically that figure gets to be a higher than the normal historical figure in terms of uh, the top line. If, yes, I agree with you broadly speaking, you are correct uh, that the inflation adjusted simply you are, you are trying to, uh, to use a weighted average inflation for the year to convert your numbers into, into revenue. Um, and then of course, you also do the same on your cost and, and, and of course, but the significant issue is on your profit line, where now you record um, the, the gains from, from uh, 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 your, your foreign currency gains, sure. uh, the gains in asset revaluations all comes into and contributed to your, 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 your profit line. Um, and that is a distinction from the... Uh, from the historical historical numbers. Um, and uh, Anthony, may you shed light in terms of your outlook, given what's playing out in terms of the COVID and, of course, a worsening macroeconomic setup. The first point is that uh, the elephant in the room is COVID-19. Um, in terms of its impact on business right now and the impact on business projected into 2020. I think it will be very significant, it goes without saying, but it will depend to a large extent how government at a, at a macroeconomic level is going to respond to deal with that issue and also to introduce a stimulus for the productive sector. If government comes up with a credible, implementable, a stimulus for the productive sector that to a large extent will mitigate the anticipated negative impact of uh, COVID-19. What does it mean for us as, uh, at a company level? I see challenges. I also see opportunities in the, in, in, in the unfolding business environment. The first uh, challenges I see is, is the aggregated demand will continue to be, to be negatively affected, uh, simply because the, uh, the, the informal sector has been disrupted, businesses have been disrupted, and it will take time to recover. So I see that as a challenge. But I also see uh, opportunities for our company. First, we still have a very strong balance sheet 
with a low gearing ratio, um, which means we have a capacity to leverage that balance sheet and tap into funding opportunities which might arise as a result of overall reform program. Number two, I also see a potential for our company to continue the milk development agenda, focusing on high impact, low cost areas. Um, already, we have some very uh, interesting uh, uh, programs we are working on, which will uh, certainly, if they come online, uh, improve milk supply. So I'm fairly confident that our milk supply base in 2020 will remain strong as it was last year, even a little bit stronger if these other supply initiatives come to fruition. I also see um, a very uh, interesting development, which is the re reshaping your business, your business model. I think the challenges from uh, the disruptions which has been caused by COVID simply means it can't be business as usual. And you can't go back to the pre-COVID era. And so we are beginning to work to reshape our business uh, into the future post-COVID. On the cost front, on our route to market distribution, on our research and development, on our brand penetration, uh, both on the domestic and export are some of the issues which we are uh, focusing attention. The other low hanging fruit I see is that the introduction of the mount current, well, the authorities will probably say such time in 185 rather, but it is a mount current, which allows us to tap into domestic nostril. That has a huge a strategic advantage for our company, where we will be able to a access a scarce foreign currency and deploy it for importation of raw and packaging material at a cost competitive a rate than it would have been if you were all borrowing from the, the banking sector. So I think there are quite a, a, a number of uh, exciting opportunities as well as challenges as we look into the future. Let me also finally look at the the other area, which is probably a challenge, is that on our exports. When we look at our exports, last year, the performance of our export was quite commendable. But now, because of the vicissitude triggered by COVID, regional currencies are weakening, uh, and, and of course, a triggering inflation and a dampening uh, uh, demand from the regional market. So we see a situation where the foreign uh, exports will certainly be uh, um, uh, challenged compared to last year. But on the other side, as I've said to you, the domestic and nostril uh, is an opportunity zone. We wanted you to comment a bit on your export business. Um, your export revenues scaled 100% from $1.7 million in 2018 to um, $3.4 million in 2019, despite you having exited um, your operations, of course, in Malawi. We, we, had, we had a good run for 20, 2019 on our exports, um, mainly because we managed to penetrate into regional markets such as Zambia, Botswana, uh, Mozambique, and, uh, and, and also into, into South Africa using alternative channels into that market. So, so we had a good run in 2019. At the beginning of the year, uh, we were also uh, still uh, achieving a significant improvement until the onset of uh, COVID-19, which has disrupted that, uh, that, that route to market. Um, it's still too early for us to, to, but however, we will continue to nurture the regional uh, export opportunities. Whilst we are 
doing that, we also see an opportunity where we are earning foreign currency through domestic, domestic nostril. Uh, we are earning foreign currency through that route, and we will continue to, uh, to develop and grow that um, as a way of uh, 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 achieving a, a foreign currency needed for uh, the procurement of our role and packaging. Now, this one would be directed toward you, Mercy. Um, in terms of COVID-19, how has the pandemic affected your distribution channels? And are we likely to see some kind of restructuring in terms of your operations, given how the COVID-19 has gripped business in, in Zimbabwe? Um, in terms of uh, volumes, obviously there's been a negative impact, mainly because of the restrictions imposed by the lockdowns. The lockdowns have closed one of, uh, closed one of our biggest channels in April, which is the vending channel. Institutions were also closed, and this is hotels, schools, and a lot of other institutions were closed. And like Anthony said earlier, a lot of business was also going through the informal market, which was largely closed in April. So it has had some impact on, on demand in the month of April. However, the opening up and the lowering down of the uh, uh, lockdown restrictions to level uh, two has seen a lot of business now. Business is now opening up, which means our road to market has also been open, opened up. In April, the CBD, most of the shops in CBD were closed, but as of today now, a lot of them are open. So we are seeing some recovery coming through. But in April, there obviously was a, um, a reduction in demand. In terms of restructuring, look, we obviously then are looking at aligning our costs to the reduced revenue, which means we put in place some cost reduction measures that uh, have helped us reduce the cost in, in April, and we see also that continuing into May. Issues that we've paid attention to relate to labor. Um, we have stepped down, obviously, some of our contract labor to align uh, the numbers to the reduced volumes. And we've also uh, put stuff that was not required on leave so as to try and manage that. We have also uh, looked at discretionary expenditure that is not directly related to uh, driving of volumes, and we have cut down on that. So there is a lot of cost reduction strategies that we have put in place, which have seen the business remain uh, strong and, and profitable. I think, I think like, we, like I've already said, that uh, the, the, the month of April was a disruption. Um, our, our, we hope that um, going forward now, um, it depends on what government is going to announce, hopefully by end of this week, if they, they relax a little bit more, uh, it means gradually we are coming back into business, but, but certainly the disruption of in April will spill over into May and most likely into, into June. So, so obviously, the, uh, both the volume and the revenues will be standard um, uh, because, because of this pandemic. However, like Mess say, our, our preoccupation as, uh, as management is to make sure that the alignment of your cost and, and the reduced revenue levels uh, is maintained so that the margins are not, are not seriously impaired. We are obviously going to suffer another recession. And um, now that there has been this uh, uh, further growth in terms of uh, numbers globally, that we, might, we might see the global growth slow down. And um, overall for business, I think it's quite important to look at aspects of remaining relevant even in this, in this current time. So um, the aspect of restructuring, I think it's, it's, it's equally quite key to, to, to corporates. I'm uh, just looking at how to protect margins 
in, in, in light of this, of this trade in revenue. Uh, back to you, Mercy. What is the arrangement with regards to your properties and how has this affected perhaps your um, arrangements with third parties with regards to uh, the pandemic? Is, is it going to affect the small revenues that you get from that very channel? Can you shed more light in terms of that particular aspect of your business? I think <clears throat> the way the properties are structured is there are owner-occupied properties and there are properties that we are leasing to third parties. Most of the third parties are franchises that are distributing dairy board products in the markets where dairy board is not physically present. Where we did an analysis and say to ourselves, these markets are too small for us to have physical presence. We have appointed agents that are distributing products in those areas on our behalf. And those are the third parties that are occupying those properties. And there has not been any change in terms of the occupation levels. We have managed to maintain all the properties that were being listed out with the tenants that are there. Now, many thanks to our panelists, Anthony, Mercy, as well as respect. Thank you uh, for my team and myself to you guys. Uh, you're doing an incredible work out there to inform and educate our investors, our market. Um, yeah, we need to remain positive um, and, and strong. Um, uh, you know, some people said, if you are in hell, keep walking. Don't stop. <laughs> so, yes, we will keep walking. Thank you, viewers, for staying with us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow us on Twitter. Facebook and to visit our informative website www.equityaccess.net. Till next time, danke and ciao.